I, I think, you know, taking a step back at the very beginning, thinking about it and making sure you've got all your your own um, your own internal stakeholders on board, of course, as well, um, is really important. So this isn't just an accounting issue or a tax issue. I would say you need to look at your investor relations team from an investor's point, does this work, etc. So it's really kind of a multidisciplinary model in order to make sure that this works across, across yeah. the board. So it's really just planning for that well in advance. There's been a number of international and Irish tax changes in, yeah. in recent times, um, all of which are relevant to the financial services industry in, in Ireland. Now, these include the anti-hybrid rules that have been in place since 2020, the interest limitation rules that uh, came into effect January 2022, and then very importantly, the Pillar 2 rules or the minimum 15% tax rate that's coming into effect for years commencing after the 1st of January 2024. Yeah. Now, all of these very important tax developments. The one thing that we have noticed is that the accounting treatment have become more and more important to the tax treatment. And in particular, the whole issue of whether an entity in Ireland has to be consolidated, yeah. forms part of a consolidated group for accounting purposes. For example, under the anti-hybrid rules, they, they apply essentially between payments between associated enterprises. And a big part of that definition is whether they're all part of the same consolidated group for accounting purposes. Under the interest limitation rules, again, whether you are in an interest group depends on whether you're in the same consolidated group, whether you can avail of the group escape provisions. But very important, in particular for securitization companies in, in Ireland, is if you're part of a consolidated group, you can't avail of a very important escape provision, which is called the single company worldwide group relief provision. And for pillar two purposes, and that's very important because that applies a minimum 15% tax rate to entities within scope. That only applies if that entity is part of a group where the consolidated turnover, uh, two out of the last four years, is 750 million. Mm. So if you're not part of a consolidated group, those rules don't apply to you. So what does that mean in, in practice? Well, it means that, for example, aircraft leasing entities in, in Ireland that form part of a 750 million consolidated group, they'll pay tax at 15%. Everybody else still pays tax at 12.5%. Uh, securitization vehicles, Section 110 companies with profit participating notes, those that are part of a consolidated group with turnover, 750 million, they may not get a full deduction anymore for all of their profit participating interests uh, because under the Pillar 2 rules, you're only allowed a deduction equal to an arm's length amount. Something that, that is still new and I don't think a lot of people have, have realized at this point. So this whole question of whether you're consolidated or not mm -hmm have become absolutely fundamental, important for anti-hybrid and interest limitation rule purposes, but absolutely foundational to the question as to whether these entities are going to be subject to tax at 15%. Which brings us now to the important question. I think it's useful <laughs> to remind us, when, when exactly do you have to be consolidated? If you're an Irish entity, when do you have to be consolidated for accounting purposes into the accounts of another entity? And, and what are the exclusions? Sure, Peter, and, and I agree. I mean, we've been working, I, you know, you and I have been working with our clients together on this and, and, you know, there's no one size fits all. It's a really kind of complex area and investment structures all have their different nuances. And so I think clients really do need to look at it both from a tax perspective, a, an accounting perspective, a legal perspective, a regulatory perspective. Pres um, you know, so I think, you know, when we're looking at consolidation under IFRS, um, what we're really looking for is power. So the power to the power to direct uh, variable returns, the power to control the entity. Um, and that's really what IFRS is, is focused on. So power is looked at in a few different ways, I suppose. One is voting rights. Potentially, you look at voting rights. But in the absence of voting rights being a dominant factor, um, IFRS does provide guidance for um, entities where there may be contractual arrangements that mean that actually control um, and power 
resides elsewhere. So for example, if you've got the power to direct uh, funds or if you've got the power to direct um, how an, an entity um, is, and actually operates, if you've got the power to direct uh, where the variable returns come from, all those things um, become very important. And so, you know, like I said at the beginning, you know, you really do need to look down through your governing docs. You really do need to look down through actually where is power residing. Um, and I think that we find that when we talk to our clients, that's not always very straightforward, especially in these comp more complex investment structures so it sounds to me it's not quite a black and white answer so if, if I'm now establishing an entity and let's say I'm establishing a section 110 entity and it's going to be paying profit participating interest a variable return to another entity in the group and they may or may not be consolidated is there a black and white answer as to whether you consolidate or not is there some judgment involved is it a gray area um, so yeah, there, there, there can be judgment involved and I suppose what I'm advising clients when they're coming to set up in Ireland in the first instance is really look at that and really look out to the future and, and think, okay, if the structure w w works for me now, you know, is it, does it, do you need to look from the tax or so contact yourself or whatever? You know, it, it's definitely not looking at what the, what the current status is today. So you can't, you know, you're trying to future proof, I suppose, is, is so when you come in, you're trying to look beyond today's um, world and look to future tax um, uh, tax uh, laws that might that might come down the track. So um, I would say that you know it's it's not a it's a, it, it is something that you've to you've to consider from many different angles, um, and you've to consider the legal view, how you're setting up your prospectus, how you're setting up the entity. Um, and so when I'm saying to clients, what I'm saying is is you know look at the purpose, and then from from look at the purpose of the entity, the design of the entity, and just make sure that it is ticking the boxes in terms of if consolidation is not what you want, that you're actually making sure that that is the case um, across all those dials. Yeah, so if a, if a client is, is looking at setting up a structure now, and, and again, we have to look at the tax implications and the whole question of whether they're going to be consolidated or not is absolutely crucial as part of evaluating the tax implications as part of structuring the vehicle. Where, where, where would I go to get an answer as to whether there's going to be a requirement to consolidate or, or not? Do I, do I go to an, an accounting firm and get an accounting opinion? Or should I go to my auditor and, and see what is my auditor's view? How, how does one approach concluding on this point? Yeah, so I mean, what we see with clients is they first do their own analysis um, and they would generally run that by their auditor, whether that's us or whether they're, we're their accounting advisors. They would generally run it by their auditor. I mean, ultimately, they have to get their auditor happy mm -hmm. with that because the auditor will be assigning whatever the opinion is. So you do ultimately have to get your, your auditor happy. Um, but whether you choose when you're doing your own analysis, if you feel that you need that expert advice to assist you, you probably have to do that outside of your auditor because obviously your auditor can't advise you. You know, they can, they can review something, but they can't advise you exactly on, um, on a structure. So what we would see is people maybe getting advice and um, working with a tax team, working with an accounting team, getting that advice um, and then making sure that that, but sometimes, you know, clients can do it by themselves, but generally they will want to run it by their audit and their tax advisors in any event. Yeah. So, so the bottom line is ultimately one for any new structures that are being set up. One can't just look at the, the tax in isolation no, anymore. No, definitely not. One, one does yeah. have to follow a multidisciplinary approach and, yeah. and get a sense of what the accounting treatment is is, is going to be. And I, and I think that's the, that's the reality. I, I think, you know, taking a step back at the very beginning, thinking about it and making sure you've got all your, your, own, um, your own internal stakeholders on board, of course, as well, um, is really important. So this isn't just an accounting issue or a tax issue. I would say you need to look at your investor relations team from an investor's point, does this work, etc. So it's really kind of a multidisciplinary you know, um, model in order to make sure that th this works across across yeah. the board. So it's really just planning for that well in advance. Yeah. Um, and that's what we've been dealing with clients. And, and it's not just indeed clients that are coming to Ireland. Some of it is talking to clients that are here locally already and people that were, you know, they're setting up new structures or indeed structures they already have. And they're kind of looking towards the, the future on those ones. Yeah, because I, I think the reality of the matter is, is that we're seeing this increasingly closer convergence between the accounting and the tax rules and the tax rules being more and more impacted by, by the accounting treatment. And, and I would say it's not just for, for future structures being, being set up, but, but certainly I think all players that are involved in the financial services industry in, in Ireland that certainly are potentially within scope of, of the Pillar 2 rules, uh, I'd say early impact assessments absolutely crucial. I mean, the rules will only start taking effect next year. In Ireland, we still have to enact the rules here. So there's a whole process that will happen this year. But the truth of the matter is I, I don't think clients can, can wait until the finance bill appears in October to start doing that uh, impact assessment. One has to look at it uh, as soon as possible to determine what the potential impact might be 
uh, for, for entities that are uh, potentially within scope. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And I think what I've seen is that sometimes takes iterations, right? So you, you, you provide, you, you know, you internally, you come up with your first analysis, clients come up with their first analysis, they run it by tax advisors, they run it by their auditors, they run it by accounting. And there's, you know, there's iterations and that can take time. Then you might need to bring your board through that and make sure your board is comfortable with it. Um, so it, it's managing all that um, and that does take time.